Sheep, the mainstay of the local economy, although today you'll only get to see sheep on the high street at Sheep Day. But the name Skipton is a derivation of the words sheep town. Man has lived in these parts for millennia. There was an Iron Age settlement near the top of Sharper, and these well-worn cup and ring stones are found close to Snay Gill. People kept to the high ground then, as where Skipton is today was the site of a glacial lake. Eventually, this was drained by the River Eyre, leaving behind rich farmland. Trading routes were opened up through the Craven Gap to Wharfdale and into Lancashire over the Pennines. When the Romans came in, about 70 AD, they built a road from Tadcaster to Ribchester. There was a fort at Ilkley, and the road went through Addingham and over Skipton Moor. This road was still in use until about 1836, when the present road to Drafton and Ilkley was built, cutting out the momentous pull up Shortbank Road. It was then known as Showed Bank, and the poet Thomas Gray said it was the steepest hill I ever saw a road carried over in England. The Romans didn't settle in Skipton, although there was a villa, a farm, at Gargrave. The first we really knew about it was in 1086, when William the Conqueror of Normandy, who defeated King Harold at the Battle of Hastings, had the Doomsday Book compiled, letting him know all about the lands and possessions he'd gained. It says that Skipton was once owned by Earl Edwin, and that its lands covered around 500 acres. It was described as waste, meaning that anything there might have been destroyed, to put down any opposition to William. It says that the king now owned the land, as Edwin was killed in 1070. It was when William gave this land to Robert de Romilly, the family that gave its name to Rombald's Moor, that the story of Skipton really begins. He built the first castle here. To the north it's defended by a 40 metre high cliff, which has the added attraction of Ellerbeck running along the base. Wallerbeck defended it to the east. This first castle would have been made just of wood and surrounded by a defensive ditch. The de Romilies also established Holy Trinity Church, again originally a wooden structure thought to have stood where the present-day church is. It was Robert's daughter, Cecily, who married William Meshin, who gave lands at Emsey to Augustinian canons, the so-called black monks because of the colour of the robes they wore, to establish a priory. This was built in 1120, thought to be in this area. However, it struggled to survive, and so the de Romilly family gave land, next to the River Wharf at Bolton, to rebuild the priory there in 1155. Holy Trinity and its lands were then endowed, that is, its annual rental income given, to financially support Bolton Priory, a relationship not only financial but also clerical, as the canons were appointed vicars, an arrangement that was to continue until 1539, when the priory was dissolved by Henry VIII. The village started to grow outside the castle walls, initially in the vicinity of Mill Bridge. Access to the clean, soft, fast-flowing waters of Ella Beck was not only vital to life, but also for the cleansing of wool. We know that by the middle of the 13th century, there was a fulling mill here, a mill that used water power to pound finished cloth and remove all grease from it. By this time, the de Romilly line had died out and the lands had reverted back to the king, Edward I. He, in turn, awarded them to Robert de Clifford. The Clifford family were to shape Skipton from 1309 until the line died out in 1675. Skipton in the 14th century would have just been a hamlet. It hardly grew because of plagues and the Scottish incursions after the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, at which Robert de Clifford was slain. The castle was rebuilt in stone to repel the Scots. The oldest part of the castle that is still extant today is what was then the inner gatehouse, thought to have been built around 1220. It opens to the conduit court, so called as the castle has no natural water supply, water had to be channelled here. It has two principal features, the coat of arms of the Cliffords above the Tudor period doorway and the yew tree that was planted in 1659 by Lady Anne Clifford. In the late 13th, early 14th century, the round drum towers were built. 
Look here, the walls are almost 13 foot thick. Notice how the skirt of the wall curves, making it almost impossible to scale. These slits were made for bowmen to fire arrows at the approaching enemy. To get here you would have had to already have crossed a 30 foot moat that was filled with water 7 feet deep. The moat collapsed a number of times over the centuries and has now been filled in. The modern road that skirts round the outer walls, the Bailey, was also a defensive ditch. The path runs at a higher level, as in 1820, at a time of trade depression, unemployed townsfolk were put to work to make this path, called Hard Times Walk, for obvious reasons. The gatehouse through which you enter today was built in 1310. The Clifford motto on top, Desol May, means henceforth. HC stands for Henry Clifford, who lived between 1592 and 1643. The dragon on the flag, a red wyvern, is the heraldic symbol of the Cliffords. Although Holy Trinity had been rebuilt in stone by this time, the Cliffords had their own private chapel built in the castle grounds, the Chapel of St John the Evangelist. This was built around 1330. It's now disused and has been for centuries. About 1800 it was used for stabling horses. The Cliffords were mostly buried at Bolton Priory until the dissolution of monastic orders in 1539. And after that they were interred in the parish church, where the tombs can still be seen. Much of the outside of the church dates from the late 15th century, when there was a massive rebuilding programme. But the South Isle predates 1350, and the position of the sedilia, seats for the canons and vicars, probably indicates the position of the original altar. The church is 134 feet long and 54 feet wide, and can seat around 900 parishioners. The choir is screened from the congregation by what was originally a rood loft, a wooden structure that held the crucifix. The upper section was removed in 1802 as part of the reorganisation of the church to make way for the organ. Galleries at the tower end were removed in 1909. Look above you in the aisle to see the oak roof and look for the green man, a pagan fertility symbol. The shields above the altar. The one on the left is that of Bolton Priory, which governed the church from 1326 until 1539, and the one on the right is of Christchurch, Oxford, to whom it was given after the dissolution. But since 1919 it now forms part of the Diocese of Bradford. On the way in, look for this fresco on the left. It was painted by the monks of Bolton Priory and represents the hands of death. Near it is the octagonal font that is over 700 years old. The cover is Jacobean, that's around 400 years old. It's raised and lowered on a pulley system. An odd feature that was only uncovered in the renovation of 1909 is the entrance to a hermit's cell. Someone lived here in medieval times and arms, or food and drink, would have been passed through a window to him. Many people visit the church to see the Clifford tombs. There are three that contain five earls, three countesses and four children. The oldest, to the north side of the altar, is to Henry Clifford, the first Earl of Cumberland, who died at the castle on the 22nd of April 1542, and his second wife, Lady Margaret Percy. There are twelve other relatives buried in the vault beneath. The brass at the head shows the family of Henry, the second Earl of Cumberland, kneeling in prayer. The small tomb is to Francis, the son of the third Earl. He died aged five years, eight months in 1589. Early death was not uncommon in those days, and you were lucky to survive infancy. The largest and most ornate tomb to the south of the altar is to his father, George, the third Earl of Cumberland. He died in London on the 30th of October 1605, although he wasn't interred here until the 13th of March 1606. Although it's also a memorial to his wife, Lady Margaret Russell, who died in 1616, she is actually buried in Appleby Chapel. It was their daughter, Lady Anne Clifford, who erected the tomb to honour her parents. It was also her that had the church repaired after the Civil War. 
Not only was it hit by cannonballs, but also, as the Cliffords were royalists, the tombs were defaced and brasses stolen. If you look in some of the windows, you'll see the initials AP and the date 1655. AP stands for Anne, Countess of Pembroke, as on her second marriage she married Philip Harbert, the Earl of Pembroke. 1655 refers to the year the church was repaired. There's a much more detailed tablet on the tower roof. If you look at the tower from the outside, you'll notice the change in the stonework. The tower was badly hit in the Civil War and had to be part taken down and rebuilt upon medieval foundations. There's been a clock on the tower since 1769, although this one dates from 1899. The graveyard is in front of the church, but the tombs were removed in the 1950s, although they can still be seen around the back. The church stands at the top of the high street. This wide street was developed to accommodate the market. The first market charter was given way back in 1203. 